startup company or scale-up company, uh, you could say, called Iodon, that is working with decentralized storage. So this talk's gonna be a bit about decentralized storage and about what Iodon is doing in that space. Uh, before we get started on what decentralized storage is and what Iodon is doing in that space, before it might be good to start the narrative off as why are we even talking about decentralized storage um, and how is it possible? So um, the main reason um, for decentralized storage, I would say right now, and why it's becoming very interested and interesting, and there's a lot of companies dealing with it, is the fact that data is becoming a much more uh, valuable resource, and it's being produced much more. I mean, we have streaming applications and services such as YouTube, Netflix, and Disney Plus, so on and so forth, that are producing massive amounts of data. We have social media platforms like Facebook, Snapchat, uh, among others. And unfortunately, we also have TikTok, uh, that are also producing massive amounts of data. And we're also in a world where we're trying to digitize society. And this, this also demands a lot of data. So there's, there's this is a massive amount, a need, massive amount uh, of data being produced, and there's a need for upscaling uh, data storage uh, globally. Uh, data centers, mainly tier three and tier four data centers, are the ones that are uh, custodians of this data, you could say, for uh, service providers. But uh, it's not very easy just to build a, a tier three or tier four data center. You, you're quite location specific, you need a lot of redundancies and so on and so forth. So it takes some time, but the data consumption and data production is not waiting for data centers. It's increasing, increasing. And it's also because of bandwidth uh, opportunities which make it more possible. The other reason why decentralized storage is becoming something that people are looking at is the value of data. So businesses and individuals uh, that are producing data are leaving behind a footprint in the cloud. This data can be extremely valuable. It can be corporately critical. Um, and there come, comes a question, who is privy? Who can see what I'm producing? Who's looking at my data? Who's monetizing or storing my data on their platforms? And this is, this is a big problem, and it's a question that no one's really answering because no one really knows, and that's the big problem. So uh, what decentralized storage is trying to do is to look at alternatives to ways you can store data uh, that you can store critical data on. We're not trying to really be a versus, uh, we're just trying to be added, added value to the cloud in general and provide those that want to have somewhere extremely safe to store their data there, they have full control of, a place to do so. So what is decentralized storage? Uh, centralized storage, you guys probably all know about. So if you have uh, cloud provider A, and a really big American company, um, they build their own data centers, that's basically as centralized as you get. They're in complete control of the network, everything is stored there, all their applications on top. They're the ones in control. Um, you also have something called distributed data uh, networks, which is basically the same, but they outsource some of that power and storage, the capacity that they need to uh, national providers, such as for example, Digiplex or Green Mountain or whatever, what have you. Decentralized storage is about um, changing their whole governance model. So no one's in control, all nodes are alike, and the company that's providing the facility of technology to allow this to happen has no control over the network itself. We do, we're just a bridge in between. So there's no governance model. We don't have any control of your data. You're the only one that has control of your data. And all nodes are alike. What do I mean by nodes? Um, what, do, what is I want trying to do with this uh, situation? Well, we see, and uh, this is where the, sort of the, uh, the sustainability comes in, we see that the world has a lot of storage available. Um, we see there are data centers that have storage available. We see that there are private computers that have storage available, and we think that's a great opportunity to provide storage and capacity to those that want it without having to build new infrastructure. So, I mean, you, all of you have probably got a data uh, computer at home where you have used some of your hard drive. I'm guessing some of you haven't used all your hard drive. Uh, and that, that hard drive you have left could be used to provide storage to a network such as Igon. We have sort of devised four layers of how we see this network evolving. So the first one is data centers, professional providers. We already have a big partnership with one of the biggest global data center providers in the world. Um, second layer 
is uh, personal computers, like I just said, probably the computers you have at home where the storage capacity is uh, available. The third part is mobile telephones. I mean, you guys have probably all heard about that, how uh, a modern mobile telephone is more powerful than the computing system that they used to send a man to the moon in the 1960s. Uh, so, I mean, I don't use my phone for much uh, more things than just Strava and looking at cat pictures on Instagram. Um, and I'm guessing most people don't use the full extent of their capacity on their machines either. So mobile, mobile storage uh, facilities and capacities is very, very interesting, especially if you start thinking about mesh networks and smart cities and how you can use uh, mobiles for edge computing later on. And then the fourth and final part, uh, which just touched upon this sort of IoT nodes, where we could use uh, then as part of the cache of small instances of data storage capacity for when uh, smart systems go offline, which could be like in areas like in Africa or in tunnels, with trains and so on and so forth. And the idea about why, why would you use Igon for this, well the idea is that the storage is completely secure. Um, and you might be thinking, okay, so how do you do that? How, why would I want to use Igon if, I'm, if my data is being stored on someone's personal computer or something, it doesn't sound very safe. So this is obviously something that we have to really think very hard about. And this is something we think we've cracked and we, this is what we want to develop now. So what we do is we take your data, you upload your data onto Iagon. What happens then? It gets sharded. I don't know if many of you played that Fruit Ninja game on your iPhones when it came out, where you sort of had a fruit and you could just slice it into many different types of random parts. I thought it was a great game, but it's basically the same idea. It looks very random for us human beings, but we have a, an AI behind it that's segmenting all the files into extremely small pieces. And then what happens then is that that file is, all those pieces are encrypted and then distributed to the network. Uh, I don't know if any of you know anything about blockchain, but what, the, what that means in our terms is that we broadcast it to the network and then all the nodes in the network that are interested in providing the storage capacity say, hello, I can hold that, and then a random number of those storage providers are used. So that's how it works. What, but what if a node goes down? So you don't have your computer on all the time. I'm sure, the, I'm sure the, your, your better halves or other halves might get a bit angry if you've got the computer going all day long. Or you might be traveling somewhere, your telephone might turn off. Uh, and through our encryption model, we have a buffer of information that allows um, certain parts of the file to disappear, we can still recover the entire file. This is something very interesting, especially for data centers. Um, unfortunately, we, we haven't got, had a product ready for when Facebook went down yesterday, but this would be the type of product that could actually have helped with backup relief. Another really important part of data storage is compliance. Um, have GDPR compliant here, as it's probably one of the most well-known types of compliance that we have to uh, uphold when we're protecting data. Um, Igon's in the position where we're, we're building technology in an atmosphere where regulation is being evolved to protect individuals and businesses and their data, the data they produce. Google, Amazon, um, Microsoft, IBM, they sometimes breach this uh, agreement, this GDPR uh, regulation. And it's not because they want to, it's just because the technology they have in place wasn't built at the same time. So they're trying to bootstrap, change it as they go along, but they will, they will fail. We have a little bit of advantage because we're building in an atmosphere which is already showing what the contours of this type of regulation will be. Uh, and how does it work? Well, once you upload your data, if you have GDPR compliant data that you need to protect, say for example, health data, you can just, and it has to be in Norway, for example. You can just, you, when you upload your data, you can just, you can uh, determine which geographical location you'll, the nodes you'll be using. So if you're like, if it's uh, going to your medical journal, for example, you, or some sort of uh, receipt or something that's very important for you to keep in a special place, once you upload it, you can just press down on the down menu and you can choose what country you need to keep yourselves within and the data will be uh, broadcast to the network in that area. But you might also be thinking, okay, this sounds okay. I think, I hope all of you think it sounds great and you just want to hop on. Um, but you might be thinking, 
why would anyone want to give storage away? And we're not asking for people to give it away, we're asking people to get paid for giving their storage away. So it's a passive income for both uh, private persons and data centers that join the network. And we're not asking for them to give uh, storage that using for other, other uh, facilities or other customers, we're asking for their available storage. And they are only contractually obliged to be part of the network for a month at a time. So we're not asking for that available storage to always be available. We believe that once we roll out, we'll be using more individuals than we will be using data centers after a while. But I'll get to something else now that's more interesting for you guys. So we've been thinking a lot about how to work with the data centers when we were building Iogon uh, conceptually. And we see that there are some issues with data centers that I've touched a little bit on already and some other stuff as well. But we believe that we have a, an amazing product that data centers can use to white label and provide their customers with extra security and protection. The first part of it is up, an upscale solution for data centers. So perhaps you have a tier three data center someplace in Norway or somewhere else in the world, and maybe even Africa, God knows, and you have clients that are wanting more storage, but you don't have that storage available right there and then. So what do you do? Well, you can, you can invest in layer one, layer two, layer three infrastructure, get that all fixed up, uh, get the land built up and all that. That's gonna take time, take a lot of resources, but what if you had a virtual data center that you could just, on the press of, um, press of a button, probably a little bit more complex than that, but the press of a button, you'd open up more storage to your clients. We don't have to sell that to your clients, that can be something that you sell to your clients. The other thing that we can also do is turn a tier one or tier two data center, as long as they have some storage, storage, storage capacity, and this is something that we're looking at very closely in Africa, because of the infrastructure there, is turning tier one and tier two into tier three, through using cloud redundancy. I was talking about earlier on, so the file's in one place and we can retrieve the file. So that's one area that we see as a big market for. The second part is, and uh, this is why I went about Facebook, is uh, backup uh, and disaster relief. So a lot of data centers have expensive data relief uh, and disaster backup. Uh, solutions that they use with third-party couriers, we can provide that at a much cheaper price because of how the network is built. So we believe that we, we offer the data center industry a very good opportunity to make more money or and save more money. So that's uh, basically what I have to tell you guys right now. I hope next time I'm here I have much more to show you and actually show you the actual working products. Um, but just to summarize, so we want to provide storage capacities at a fraction of the cost to what other uh, cloud companies are doing today. And we want to be able to uh, leverage our application to provide data centers with added value to their customers. So that's what I have to say today. I think I'm a bit quick, but you guys look very hungry. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if anyone has any questions. Any questions, anybody? Uh, one question for me. Yeah. You're, taking, uh, you're talking about value. Um, how could a data center operator give to this and um, compare it to, to, the, to the ordinary solutions? Once we have the product up and running, they'll be able to see uh, cost differences, they'll be able to evaluate the cost difference, yeah. and then the performance difference as well. Yeah. So you have, how do you use some tools and apps or computers? So this is what we're building now. We're also building it in a microservice uh, architecture, mm. so it'll be a turnkey solution. So if you have C, if you're a data center and you see, okay, we, we have a need for a specific type of function and we would like to leverage a, a flexible dynamic cloud storage solution on top, we can help you build that application on top that's specifically designed for what your company needs or your clients' needs are. Mm. But uh, if you're going into this solution, um, how could they, are you able to, to, to give them the, the trust in the system? That's, uh, that's a good question. And I should have touched upon it earlier, but one of the reasons why decentralized storage hasn't been thing for very long, there's only about five uh, different companies working at it at the moment, is because we use blockchain technology to provide trust in the network. Now blockchain, the reason for using blockchain is two things. Number one is the security of using a public blockchain network, like uh, for example, Ethereum, Cardano, which are massive networks that have massive um, validators so if you were going to break the security of the network, you'd have to be Russia, China, and the United States combined 
which basically means it's unfeasible to actually break the security behind the, uh, behind the network. But the second part of it is also to do with that um, only the person with the private key can actually go in and change the data in our system. So the idea is that we're not trying, like I said earlier on, we're not trying to compete against Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, and all these others. What we're trying to do is provide people with an extremely secure place of storage. Hmm. Okay, so uh, but I think legal wise, uh, um, if you have a company that wants to try this out, um, mm -hmm. you, you should give them uh, the confidence that uh, they need to do think to, to be able to, to trust uh, your setup. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and we, we won't be releasing anything until we've done all the penetration tests yeah. and uh, been audited very well and we have some ISO certifications. But it looks good so far, we're getting some help from Ernst & Young, the legal aspects of the application, and uh, we're involving external advisors in terms of uh, the encryption and the security of the, of the product as well. Mm. Very interesting. Mm. Okay, okay. any more questions? Okay, then uh, let me thank you so much and um, give him a...